Wilt Chamberlain was one of the greatest basketball players of all time. Seven foot one, he towered over everyone, moved like a ballet dancer, dominated inside the paint. He was unstoppable. Well, almost. Wilt the Stilt had one devastating flaw. Chamberlain is 0 for 4 from the foul line. From dunking the ball. With that weight and whatever, you know, they had no any better than I did. I, was... I went to a psychiatrist just then, you know, and uh, for about a month uh, on, my, on my free throw situation. After a month, I, I, I gave it I gave it up. Somebody else paid, paid for the session, $50 a session. I won't say it wasn't, you know, and I, after, <laughs> after I came out of it for a whole month, I, I uh, the psychiatrist was a better free throw shooter than I was. <laughs> 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 you know, that's, 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 how, that's how it happened, Justin. That's right. He couldn't hit a free throw to save his life. And this is a problem because a dominating player who can't hit the foul shot, well, gets fouled. A lot. Desperate for a solution, Chamberlain sought help from 12-time All-Star and one of the greatest free throw shooters of all time, Rick Barry. Uh, during one season, Barry only missed nine free throws. Not, not 9%, which would have been amazing. Just nine total the whole season. With Barry's help, Chamberlain raised his average free throws from the dismal 50-50 coin toss uh, to the high 60s and 70% range. In one game, Chamberlain sank over 80% of his shot from the line. Uh, he went on to score 100 points in that game, a record that nobody's ever come close to beating. All right, problem solved. Well, not exactly. Turns out, the solution to Will Chamberlain's free throw problem was to shoot underhanded. It's foul shooter. <laughs> Some people accept about... under pressure. Except under pressure. Although not the greatest foul shooter, Will can make them when there is something at stake. Today, it's only the last two points in the game. It's clutch time now. The 76ers take the lead by one. And some have actually theorized that the reason Will Chamberlain was not a great foul shooter was... Yep, that's right. The much reviled granny shot. Turns out that granny style is the most efficient way to shoot a basket uh, when you're not being blocked. It's perfect for three free throws. But nobody shoots that way. It's understood that the more physically complex overhand shot is the way to throw. Um, any attempt to do something else is met with ridicule, pointing, and laughing. Well, Will Chamberlain felt silly shooting granny style, so despite his success, he stopped and his free throw percentage plummeted. Why would somebody find a solution to a problem that clearly works, but not do it? That doesn't seem to make a dang bit of sense. Well, before we get too hard on Will Chamberlain, there's probably a whole lot of stuff that you do, and I do, that we just do, that doesn't make much sense when we stop and think about it. But we do these things because we tend to conform to the rules of our social groups and the larger society. Even when doing so, it doesn't make much, make much sense. Understanding this is what sociology is all about. Sociology is the study of society and its influence on human behavior. Hey, we all live in a society. We've lived in one our whole lives. How has that society shaped who we are? How do we constrain our behaviors to meet society's standards? Why do we do things like take drugs, participate in physically brutalizing sports, work desperately to shape our bodies to, to some standard of beauty, study finance when we really want to be musicians, but what are some things that we do that don't make a dang bit of sense when you really stop and think about them? Sociology is about stopping and thinking about the external forces that shape who we are. As such, I see sociology as the study of human freedom. After all, freedom doesn't really mean much outside of the context of interacting with other human beings. But if interacting with other human beings constrains us in ways that don't make much sense, or may even be ways that don't benefit us, maybe even ways that harm us, how free can we really say we are? That's why I became a sociologist. I was a counselor who noticed that my clients, young men with delinquent and criminal records, would work hard and become really good, reliable young adults. But when they returned to their neighborhoods and schools, they often fell right back into their old delinquent routines. How could they be upstanding individuals in the middle of a swamp with me, but delinquents in schools? It wasn't about psychology. It must have been about their places. I wanted to know how I could best prepare these young people for dealing with the pressures to conform to otherwise self-destructive behaviors. While I was at it, a whole new way of looking at the world opened up to me from understanding global systems of power that encompass billions of people to looking at micro-interactions between two people on the street, to changes 
uh, some subtle, some awesome that are happening as a result of, say, online media, cell phones. Um, I'm passionate about this subject, and I'd like to open this world up to you. In the meantime, there's a high probability that after taking a sociology, you'll also pass the exam and be one step closer to that all-important Cambridge diploma. We'll look at the sociology of that as well. I hope to see you in class next year, ready to get your understanding of the world you live in and who you think you are totally rocked.